Risei Kujikawa, the idol in isolation, the thick-skinned admirer, and the investigation team's new and replacement navigator through the world of the subconscious. Despite being the sixth party member, including yourself, to become a part of the investigation team, and not showing up until a little prior than the third dungeon, which is hers, she's actually the third person that the player sees in Persona 4 when turning on the system. And showing up while doing an ad on TV, no less, which drives home immediately her widespread popularity. Risei, or as her idol name goes, Reset, is a prodigy idol who came up through her middle school years as a rising star of the idol industry. TV cameos, commercials, and plenty of live music gigs, Risei is known far and wide, with much of her merchandise even appearing when least expected in the game, like an infection, like as the keychain in the Shrine Prize, or as a model figure at Juness late in the game. Nanako is also aware of her from her TV appearances, and is a huge fan. So if this much of her has managed to spread even to somewhere as isolated as Inaba, it only attests to her renown. When Risei finally does enter the story, it's during a bit of disillusionment with herself, as she has publicly stated a leave of absence from the entertainment industry, with some people at the conference within the crowd citing as much as they're asking, asking if she has an illness, or if she has some sort of psychological issues due to being in the entertainment industry. It's lastly capped off with a question slash statement of confirmation over where she's going to be staying in her private life. It's uncomfortable and immediately gives the idea of Risei's private and public self being strained and stretched by the public perception. And of course, it's not hard to believe that this would make anyone feel trapped. The next day, Risei is the talk of the school. The idea of an idol coming to podunk Inaba is big news after all, especially for the residents. After a figure showing clear resemblance shows up on the TV, the investigation team makes an immediate haste to see Risei and warn her about any possible risks. Something I think is easy to pass over is how initially, despite Yosuke's over-exuberance claiming how hot Risei is, they actually mistake Risei for an old woman from behind when they first see her. The rough hair through the worker's clothes and the more reserved attitude completely throws them off, but in a lot of ways, the sullen Risei we see here is a lot more of a private and rarely seen self than even the one we see after she awakens to her persona. This points retroactively with what we learn later on to the idea that Risei's primary psychological trouble here isn't just the quote-unquote real self or fake self, or the pop idol reset versus the elementary school bullied Kujikawa, but instead it points to her inability to separate the two properly, or more than two, the multitude of different selves that she balances between her private and public lives and around different people. Because as she'll come to learn, and as I'm extremely excited to talk about whenever it's appropriate, all Riseis are Risei. It's just a matter of gaining control over those many identities, and powers to use those to express herself in the most honest, true-to-herself fashion. But this is obviously just the first implication of something like that here. At the end of the dungeon is when it covers it more explicitly. The first thing Risei says when appearing on the Midnight Channel is, Maru Q, push reset. Now, we know that Mara Q is the name of the family business her grandmother runs, and is, due to naming conventions for family business, is likely to be Risei's mother's and mother's side of the family's last name, with her taking on Kujikawa from her father's last name. Something also revealed later in Risei's social link, something we will obviously cover more depth in its own section later, we learn that Risei's family submitted her idol tape to the idol company without her knowledge, and Risei only found out when she had been accepted. As a young bullied girl, her family excitedly pushing for her success, Risei probably felt she had no choice in the matter, and states as much later on saying she only accepted it because she wanted to have friends. Thus, the Midnight Channel broadcast is a distorted bastardization on that idea by Reset's mind and lust for the viewers. The term push, or to push something, is commonly used when referring to new songs, new merchandise, or new idols. It's something that recurs as well in her own social link through the main story, with Risei's coming replacement, Kanamin. So, to recap, when Risei comes on video, she is stating, on behalf of her family, Q, please push reset. So then, the name of the dungeon, Q Striptease, takes on an extremely sad and disgusting meaning. From a family where the name meant business, 
In this sentimental personal extent, a girl who desperately reached and wanted friends, being fed by her family unintentionally, that would strip her of her private sexuality. Doing it intentionally, but with no real context into Risei's ability to handle it. The average idol's starting age in Japan is 13, with Risei seeming to have started even younger, maybe even at 11 or 12. Her birthday is June 1st, making Risei at the time of her dungeon less than a month into her 16th birthday. This is due to middle school and high school both lasting three years in Japan, the last year of Japanese middle school being roughly equivalent to the American freshman. So Risei likely started idling prior to puberty, and has been sexualized and speculated upon all through her development, without a time or sense to develop her own sexuality in a context not heavily tailored by the media. In her Rank 10 romance, she even mentions how much more difficult it is to confess to somebody and be open when it's for real, when it's not on TV. The Rise on TV is so well put together, she's talented and smart, often seen as this natural of the industry, but Rise doesn't know what part of her is even her, and what's being fed a line. So you see this B-roll audition tape mixed in with this sort of X-rated late night adult program, in purpose and message of her Midnight Channel appearance. It's supposed to make you uncomfortable. Even in her Shadows live commentary, leaning in on the idea of being young and starting high school, it's gross and heartbreaking. But I believe this is the full context we need to understand the name Maruku Striptease, as well as what her Midnight Channel broadcast is supposed to be emulating in terms of parroting old schlocky late night Japanese public broadcasting. Subscribe and like and comment, by the way. No, seriously, I, I need that stuff to keep me going. I love making these videos, but it's an amazingly big amount of work to do all this, and that may or may not actually pay off when it comes to engaging to convince YouTube to give me a chance. I, I need to live. I need money to live. Uh, please, please support me. Please share this video. <laughs> Once entering the dungeon, it's made pretty clear that the aesthetics mix the idea of a strip club with classic burlesque stage shows, with the heavy use of colors and spotlights drawing it as if on a stage. It also mixes in the runway of modeling, with the runway lights taking spot under the walkways of the dungeon. In regards to design, it's at some of Persona 4's most blatant here, featuring silhouettes of women, kiss marks, and an abundance of hearts on the walls, as well as curtain openings between hallways and rooms. On the floor you see a mixed design of fancy hearts, as well as a purple tile floor featuring eyeballs looking up at the player. The idea of seeing yourself before you even know yourself, to an infinite criticizing public, all the while trying to make them fall in love with you. A you that is carefully choreographed and directed to you by the people behind the curtain. And while more blatant than the previous dungeons, I think the imagery makes up for sophistication in its visceral impact. The song for her dungeon as well is the only one aside from heaven to feature lyrics. At first, it seems as though some sort of sexy whisper moaning, and that fits well with the heavy breathing and themes of the strip club, but when you listen to the lyrics, they aren't sexy in nature at all. The lyrics are still somewhat contested to this day, and wrong almost everywhere that claims to have them on the internet. Trust me, I've looked. I was surprised initially not to find an official statement on the lyrics from Atlas, but that almost certainly is because of two things. One, the voice featured is not Rise, and two, it was not recorded by Atlas. It's a pre-existing sample that to my knowledge made its first and most famous appearance in 2001 in Dance Dance Revolution, under a beginning sample for the song name Drop the Bomb by Scotty D. Are you ready? Here we go! Yeah. Scotty D, or Scott Dolph, is a bilingual composer hired by Konami who has worked on countless projects in small and big parts. Due to this sample likely coming from a DB owned by Konami, or under similar licensing, the source of the source, assuming it's not this song, could have come from literally anywhere. So let's look at the lyrics in question, which despite people claiming to hear many verses, the sample is actually only one pair of lines that repeats. The line within Risei's dungeon, while miscited all across the net, is The singer is speaking English, but is natively a Japanese speaker, and so is the accent. Like pronouncing I more like I, and the slight grammar issue later in the second phrase. 
This was pretty normal for the time, assuming Origins, if not in 2001, then even earlier, as we see this sort of thing even in Atlas games from the time and way after, including some similar grammar gaffes in Persona 3's OST. It's normal to sound weird, in other words, but it makes sense why the pronunciation with its given effect has led to much confusion over the words, or even caused people to hear different lyrics and phrases, when despite everything, the line repeated is the same vocal sample. But let's look at this in closeness to Risei. With what we already know about Risei and the visual imagery of the dungeon at hand, it's a need to drown out her feelings and focus on her goals, even when she doesn't have the will to pull the trigger herself. Just keep turning up the music, keep sending her the next project, the next task, what can she do? It's all a part of her dream. In the song it comes from, you get the pushback on this idea, like the girl starting the song is stuck in a cycle with the singer pushing to break free from it. You can pause and read the lyrics for yourself if you would like to, but the gist of the song is about fighting back against the voices telling you the way to success in your future, and how you are smart and powerful enough to make the decision yourself. How you need to use your own brain power to come up with your solution and take the reins back from other people who've been controlling your decision entirely. I think that clearly fits with Risei's story enough to be long and redundant if I covered it in detail, and so I'm gonna move on to the next bit of analysis. The mini-boss of the Reset Dungeon is a white snake with gender signs intersecting, the arrow of the male going through the hole of the female. Obvious enough imagery, especially with her saying, to be gentle before the fight. The white snake is often associated with the goddess Binzaiten, a goddess of fertility, wealth, and fortune. From the outside looking in, Risei has it all. She's young, attractive, rich, a celebrity, but like the white snake is said to live thousands of years by shedding its skin, she doesn't know if the person that's left there is even her, and feels choked and constricted by it. For her actual boss fight, we enter the center room and stage, with the strip pole in the center and several hostess bar-like couches gathered around. The glass window on the top is made of split glass that changes color and shape as they cross over each other, like how Risei is a different person under different scenarios and around different people. The real Risei is collapsed on her knees in the modest tofu shop clothing, representing her non-celebrity side, the ordinary girl. The shadow Risei standing at the pole with her perfect posture, wearing a brazen golden bikini and laughing confidently, represents the bastardized look at how Risei felt about the her that served the public, that was obsessed and drooled over, marketed and mass catered for strangers' satisfaction. The truth is, Risei does want the eyes on her. She wants to be liked. She doesn't want to be bullied like she was in school. Becoming an idol is what changed that for her, and that's what she wanted. But now, around everyone, almost everywhere she goes, she's seen as positively before she even meets others. But she had no idea as a child signing up at the time what being seen meant in context of an idol. She wanted to show herself, but she never wanted the dark side of it, not to mention the way her own burgeoning sexuality and confusion is being lost and contorted in the marketing, which as she states later, has enhanced her bus size in public showings. The image that she's been created into, that is produced by others outside of herself, how much of that is her? She likes bringing joy, she likes making people happy, but she doesn't like the feeling of loss of control, the powerlessness of it. The shadow mocks her and the team, represented as the audience, in a sort of, well, this is what you wanted, right? The reset on stage doesn't just represent the public persona, though, as she makes fun of the idea of reset, that she isn't real, that it's all reset. And so, coming into her own sexuality, her desperation to be liked as the person that she feels she deep down is, and not the image crafted, and the slight spite toward the audience, calls her to, on the pole, say, I'm no one but myself. Come on, look at me. A desperation to regain that power, to regain that control over her behavior and image, over herself, even when it's a self that she doesn't want. Because at least she'll be in control, right? Shadow Risei's boss form is a naked woman textured in many colors, flowing, cutting off, alternating seemingly at random, very similar to the glass panes above Risei before the fight. 
which lead into the interpretation I mentioned earlier. Since the actual woman's body is obstructed in detail, all but her form, by the colors, it's fair to say, are the many faces of Rise, and the many ways she's interpreted by the people in her lives. The many colors, the many emotions, the many sides, all making up Rise, all a part of her, none being the whole, and none offering the true glimpse beyond her form all obstructing Rise from clear view. The head is replaced with a satellite dish, and a hardly doubtable reference to her reaching the wide audiences she does, but also her want to reach other people. The satellite then delivers her to others' lives and screens, while they remain still far away from her, like the empty seats surrounding the stage. Nobody really knows Rise, but everyone around her has an opinion. Similarly, Shadow Rise's attacks focus on heavy move analysis and resistance nullification, how she's been raised in the industry that has turned her into someone adept at reading people and understanding what they want from her, able to change and adjust at the drop of a hat. Which is actually a trait we continue to see a lot from her after this dungeon, but maybe most notably to her relationship with Yosuke, who she often butters up to make him motivated and take her side in different arguments and conversations. Due to Teddy's intervention, the full analysis attack fails, and Rise wakes up, ready to confront herself. I was trying to figure out who the real me was. I realize now that I was on the wrong track. There is no real me. It just doesn't exist. You, me, even Rosette. They were all born from me. All of them are... me. This is a concept I have rarely seen covered in games. The one time I saw it ever addressed was in a book, and somewhat in Bojack Horseman, I guess. But to understand Rise's revelation, I think another way to ask this is, what are the traits of a human soul? There is a way that we act in front of our family. There is a way we act in front of our friends. Different friends and different family members, too. There's a way we act in romantic relationships, and even in different romantic relationships. There is a way we treat strangers, both the kind and the non-kind, the sketchy and the non-threatening. We have a personality, but that personality has many facets to it, all of which can never be displayed equally all of the time. We take actions, but many are contradictory. Do we average out all of our actions and say that's us? No because decidedly there are actions on the fringes left off of the equation. Actions decidedly ours, our principles, our political and religious beliefs, changing, unchanging, they are all parts of us. And they show that whether minute or infinitely, in all of the other aspects of our lives to varying degrees at varying times, we could get specific head trauma as well and our personality would change before we had the capability to understand our change in judgment. What makes a soul? What makes a person? The child? The adult? Our greatest failure? Or the height of our power? Is it the things that we're remembered for after we're gone? Aside from the life we have, what makes us separate from another soul? If our personality is biology, if our actions are informed by experiences, what makes us us? A book I read once contained an argument between a couple. The man desperately asked to be loved, not for his actions, not for his faults, but for who he was deep down. Well, the book asked, what is deep down? If you take away the personality, the actions, the achievements, what are you left with? A soul with no traits at all, nothing to distinguish one person from another. Carl Jung, for the 80th time, whose work Persona is based on, knew this concept well. He spent his time looking at the way that we play out through our archetypes and replay the roles of characters long dead and long revived. So to ask, who am I, is probably one of the most difficult questions of all. And yet, despite your grasp on the conclusion, your most true answer will always be, I am me. So who is the deep down? Who is the soul? It is either nothing or the culmination of everything. So when Rise says there is no real me, and follows with it that all pieces of her originated from her and are all her, that's what she means. To some, this realization is terrifying, but I also think with maturity, it's an extremely freeing revelation. The realization that there is no such thing as a real or a fake me, but that every time I personally make a choice in action, positive, negative, young or old, 
It all goes into defining the broad history of who I am. This realization causes Risei to then awaken to her first persona, Himeko. Himeko, historically known as Yamato Hime no Mikoto, was a princess who was bestowed the sacred mirror, the ancient symbol of the sun goddess. This reference of the sun goddess, who is Amaterasu, ties Risei to the main cast, as Yukiko's ultimate persona is Amaterasu, also for the 80th time. This mirror, despite the obvious link, was also said to represent wisdom and honesty, a mirror that reflects the truth of the world. The name of the mirror is Yata no Kagami. This, of course, serves Risei's role as navigator well. Someone who is to lead the team through the fog should have wisdom and clarity. They should be able to see the truth. The design is now adorned with a white robe and sash, probably a callback to Yamato Hime no Mikoto being a ruler of Japan as well as having priest-like status, being translated from Old Japanese roughly to the Daughter of the Sun, which gave the authority that the gods were behind her ruling. The body design is largely the same as the shadow as well, except all of the bright colors are now gone, as if revealing the true self, but with the dignity of now being clothed in a formal manner. The design of the satellite also changes, but the satellite itself stays the same something that carries over to her other personas as well. After Risei's recovery, and in a group scene where you end up alone, Risei comes up with a believable yet flattering reason that leans in on your reliability to start hanging out with her. Then, upon accepting it, immediately gets excited, beginning her social link. This is something that becomes apparent immediately. It's not that Risei is vain or fake per se, although she does act in a sort of fake way. I think that's part of her realizing that she can be whoever she wants to be. She wants to be around people that she likes and she wants to make them happy. So she likes saying things that will build people up, sometimes in a direct and more shameless way than many would probably be comfortable with. In fact, it's something that gets pretty consistent snide remarks from Chie and Yukiko when she does it around or in front of them. She knows now that all of her is her, and she uses that to free her, letting herself do whatever she wants and truly taking power over her own body and personality for herself. If she wants to jump and be cheerful, if she wants to be over the top with her emotions, if she wants to read the room and choose the way that she thinks is best to act, even changing on a dime in emotions, that's in her power. The control of herself is finally in her hands. And despite it leaning back on the fake idol behavior that she's been taught over the years, those years of her life were her life. And she's using the things that she knows how to do the way she wants to do them. It's liberating. The first free link for Risei involves you, as she mentioned, going around and visiting places she otherwise wouldn't have. This is really good to give an initial idea for just how strict and scheduled her life was as a child, just how out of her hands her life continued to be during her idling years. And so, whether in the agency or before, it gives you an idea that her parents rarely let her go out or even eat unhealthy foods at all. Her life has always been regulated under someone else's thumb. So this time, entering high school, staying with her grandmother, and helping at the shop is the most free she's ever been in her life. Rank 3 also lets her use the excuse of being shown around town as a reason for hanging out, but the part of her character we gain insight into is completely different and starts setting the seeds for her central conflict in her link. Risei feels she finally has the courage to disavow her public persona when asked. People come up to her and for once, she's able to tell them, no, you're mistaken, I'm not reset. She even talks about how it's true. She isn't reset, just a normal girl and that's fine. But that isn't what she learned in her dungeon. That isn't what she had taken ownership of since it either. It starts to show this sort of confusion over what she'd already covered. This interpretation is only half true to the lesson that was already covered. And you can tell it is because she still, while in the process of gaining control over her many selves, is not yet fully understanding how to wield them. Reset is Risei, but Risei is not Reset. Every part of Risei is Risei, but no part of her contains her entirety. Risei thinks she has realized herself and escaped idling, 
but it will become clear to her that she isn't fixing her problem with the conclusion. She's using the conclusion to avoid her full resolution. You see that with her complaining about Inaba, but saying that she loves it. For her grandmother, for you, and for the fact that she has something to do that personally motivates her. The case has become an outlet instead for her escapism. Next link, we meet Inoue-san, Risei's previous manager who she greets with hostility. She makes up a lie that you're her boyfriend on the spot and tries to get him to bug off about her movie appearance. Even though she has separated things with the agency privately, Inoue seems to genuinely be cared and concerned for her. For as cutthroat as the idol industry can be, and for the seedy underbelly that it can often have exposed, it's not just a hole for evil people to exploit teenagers. It's a business and an art form many people take genuine love and passion for their entire lives. Inoue seems to be one of those, as even though Risei has taken a leave, or stated her intent to possibly quit as a whole, Inoue saw something in her natural ability and feels invested still in seeing her succeed, even as the industry tracks forward. Inoue wants to make sure Risei isn't left behind, something made more apparent as the overall link goes on. My favorite line from Risei in this link is, I'm no longer a personality. Another way to address this is, she isn't a personality, she has one. She sees this number one as a way to avoid having her free time and youth crushed until the industry spits her out. We get the mention again of the movie here, and how currently it's being put on hold. Risei mentions how, since she was Inoue's daughter's age, Inoue took her in and treated her like family. But now that she's left, he's just a stranger. The player should recognize pretty easily that even as she says that, she's trying to convince herself of it. Obviously, Inoue isn't acting as if that's the case, nor does she seem to truly believe he is. Next link, Risei lets us in on how she's felt since arriving to Inaba. How she spent a lot of time to herself thinking, a lot of time trying to separate herself from Reset and find who she was apart from her identity. But even in trying to separate her from the public persona, she found herself feeling like an actor. She floats the idea that nobody can be their quote-unquote normal self all the time, so sometimes they just have to adjust. Like how she was always going to be on her best behavior around her parents, but she feels able to express herself more openly now in Inaba, with her grandma not pressuring her, and with the investigation team offering fun memories, free of judgment. Her grandma tells Risei that she's like tofu, even though it stands out from all the other foods, it can be shaped and mixed in with any flavor or recipe. That it's resilient, malleable, and strong. Her takeaway is just that it's incredible, but doesn't make the connection about the malleability, the ability to retain itself among other flavors to her own life. Being formal around her parents, flirty around you, laughing around her friends, taking in the quiet moments up on the hill and petting the cat, working the store, Risei takes all sorts of different shapes and auras everywhere she is in life. Malleable as can be, but she's always Risei. Risei takes this opportunity to talk about her childhood and mention that it's not just that she didn't have friends in school, but that she was actively bullied. How she was introverted, always looking at her feet, unable to speak with any confidence or conviction, so everyone ignored her, leaving her alone. This is where we learn the info I gave earlier about Marukyu, that a relative of hers sent in the audition without letting her know, and that it passed. Like her family was pushing her onto the stage, regardless of her own confidence or decision of whether it was a good idea to. She didn't ever want to be an idol, she just wanted to become a better version of herself. The idea was that she could make friends if she became famous on TV, and it was the only reason that she went through with it. Then came her existential crisis. Even if everyone says hi and is happy to see her, the one that they like is the fictional character sold to them. She's still unknown to everyone, even as merchandise with her face and name litter the country, like a freakish, unalive entity wearing her face and taking her name. She's totally off the mark, though. If she truly accepted Reset as part of herself in her awakening, she wouldn't be teetering back and forth like this. She asked the player, more so to state her own thought, that even now, you're only spending time with her because she's a cute famous idol, aren't you? 
although she realized how unfair that is to ask right after doing so. When she went back to school, everyone who once ignored her and bullied her now came up to her, wanting to know the famous reset. This is likely where she internalized her mindset that those two people must be separate, because those people were being fake, and her loneliness wasn't helped at all. The reason that they were fake isn't because they were impressed and interested in Reset, but because they also weren't interested in the girl who played her. It's not the interest in one that made it fake, it was the lack of interest in the whole that made it possible. Then, she felt like it was all her fault, like she was the one who wanted to change, and so she did it. But now, even if people don't ignore her, her ability of getting to know people in a normal capacity under good faith is always being pulled out as a possible manipulation. So now she thinks if she just quits being reset, things will go back to normal like how they were before, but with her added self-confidence and maturing. She doesn't realize yet that that can't happen though, even if she quits. And more surprisingly, maybe that's actually a good thing. This link is just jam-packed with info, but it closes on a positive note, with her reaffirming being happy that people know the real her, and that she has a power that can help people, which is what she loved about being an idol in the first place. How she'll transform this time into someone everyone likes. Her power in the metaverse and her reason for doing so, her joy at helping others, it isn't so different than her power to inspire others on the stage, and make people's lives enriched with her music and performances. Being a person everyone likes, and being a person you like, isn't a one-step transformation either. Neither are they necessarily coincided or contradicted. She's been working toward that since she started as an idol, and this is just part of her overall trajectory toward that. The thing is, Risei already had a glance of realizing everything that I've been saying. The thing that we're waiting for is for her to stop running from the truth, stop averting her eyes, and stand firm in what she's already affirmed herself. Next link, when Risei leaves a moment to retrieve the tofu for you as a gift, Inoue shows up and hands you a letter to give to Risei, and because he believes that she'll actually listen to you, he emphasizes just how much of a talent and a one-in-a-million performer he believes she was. After Risei sees him, she chases him away and she reads the letter, about a girl that was bullied, like Risei, and who now watched Risei and gains inspiration from it, to move forward and keep trying. Risei states also being part of an anti-bullying campaign in her career. This is the first big thing that makes it hard for Risei to keep distinguishing her desire to help others with her persona and her desire to help them with her career in idol work. She insists that she has no regrets but falls back with a pensive look on her face, a lonely smile as the game describes it. She feels she's disappointed a bunch of people, good people who look to her for strength, let down people that she wanted to help, but she continues to run, doubling down with her fantasy. Maybe she'll just inherit the tofu shop and then get married to you after all. Another line that she says to you is, it's dangerous to tell everyone what they want to hear. An ironic line as she focuses a lot of her actions around doing that very thing, even if just now she is starting to choose when and when not to do it. Rank 7 revisits Rank 3's location at Okina Station. Here, she, instead of being pestered constantly, is seeing posters and even passerbys mentioning this idol named Kanamin that is starting to take her place and leave. She insists that it doesn't bother her, but gets jealous as she hears herself dissed for being fake while her replacement is being praised for being real or authentic in some way. When in all reality, the real they see is just a produced mass persona too. Afterwards, Risei asks you if she's happy where she is right now, who she is, the way that her relationship with you operates. It's clear the criticism from random people toward Reset was taken to Risei's heart, even though she's insisted that they were separate. She tries to sell herself to you in a really sad display. Y you like having a cute underclassman, right? An ex-idol is a commodity. In her insecurity, she finds herself seeking validation in the same traits that she's been trying to dismiss herself from. After being pensive and frustrated that this topic still takes up headspace despite her quitting to try and escape that feeling, she lashes out, why would I sacrifice my real self? Like she has to choose one or the other, when that's a false dichotomy to begin with. Depending on when you do this link, Nanako also shows up and reaffirms that she likes Risei because she's Risei. 
Nanako doesn't seem to differentiate between Reset and Rise. She just sees the girl on the screen and the girl that's friends with you, the girl who is nice to her. It doesn't matter what it is that they're doing because they both come from her and she likes both of them. They're both Rise. While not changing the message, this is probably the most grim social link change from Nanako's hospitalization, but it resolves around the same. She's clearly struggling with her decision, but insists she'll feel better next time. She talks about how when she was working and idling, she felt alone, truly alone without someone to understand her problems. So now, she asks that you would stand by her, so that it's different this time. This is also the first romance flag for her social link. I don't want to be more redundant since this isn't just a summary, so I'll say that this link continues to take this route of instilling Risei's tinges of doubt and jealousy. The mayor mentions her replacement, and Inoue finally decides to give up on her coming back. He says he has to move on for the sake of the job, after all. After she started to feel like maybe her work wasn't as important after all, after she felt undervalued, Inoue confirmed her talent, the things she decided on. She still hasn't realized it, but the feeling of life passing her, of her losing direction, being uncertain and not sure if she can go back on her word, puts her into tears. Finally, her will to change. Embracing her also triggers the romance. She mentions you and the others, but the last thing she says is, there are other people who need me, right? And as she'll see, this is more than just the people she named. She leaves to think it over. In her rank 9, she finally realizes that Reset is Rise too. Yeah, you knew all along, huh? <laughs> but really, that's how it was. Reset's name in lights, idolized by the masses. That was me too. I didn't want to lose that me. There's no way to become someone else. I ran away from my plain gloomy self. Then I ran away from my idol self. Right now, I'm a high school girl just enjoying school life, I guess. I would have run away from that as well if I didn't realize. I've been trying to become how I wanted to be. I pick a role, and then after a while, I keep chasing the real me by picking another role. When in fact, those roles are all me. I don't want to run away anymore. I don't want to search somewhere else for myself. I'm gonna hang in there, as the complete me. In a lot of ways, Risei's link is the most redundant of the investigation team. Her central conflict isn't really a process of resolution following her self-discovery, but facing her self-discovery all over again. I think Risei's boss and the idea of the multiple selves and how it's wielded is a complicated topic, and the game didn't want to bog down the pacing or make things seem unnatural by writing an over-hour-long essay on it. So they divvied it out across the social links to hopefully make clear to the people in the back who didn't get the message the first time. But I don't think it's just good in this sort of metatextual way, either. Risei's conclusion of the self that she found and accepted was just another version of herself to claim and then run from. It was another stage, putting on different clothes, running to different ideas of her true self. Even the one that accepted the traits that she didn't want others to see. This link was more about her realizing and finding identity in what she thought was important, and then realizing she could do that being an idol as well. She just never made the active attempt to. She was so caught up in the loss of control that she didn't guide herself to the opportunities that she was given. So in a way, she needed this break to sort things out. Before, she did idling. Before, she sought friends. But now, with friends, she wants to help others even more. And with their strength to quell her loneliness, she can do so by revisiting the stage with new motivation. In her rank 10, she makes that decision to rejoin as an idol and to keep you watching her, being her anchor and her support to make it through the tough times. I've made up my mind about something. You see, <sighs> I'm thinking of going back into showbiz this spring. I am Rizad, after all. Do you remember the fan who gave me that letter? I'll do it for her. For my old manager, Inoue-san. For my family, everyone. You. And for myself. A Rizad without a fake smile. Senpai, I won't make the same mistake. There's no such thing as a me who isn't me. So I won't run away. I won't try to be someone I'm not. There's a lot of Rizades inside me. 
I won't try to change them. Instead, I'll let people know that those Riseis exist. That's the me I want to be. From this, Riseis' persona transforms into Kanzion, which is, for once, of Buddhist origin and not Shinto. Kanzion Bosatsu, the often androgynous Bodhisattva of mercy and compassion. It's said that due to her compassion of those who are suffering, she delays her own ascension to Nirvana, or the Enlightened Realm. This mirrors Risei, while she finds her identity and home in the people that she finds in Inaba important. For all those hurt like her, all the little girls who see her as a beacon of hope, she returns to her career to carry out what she thinks means most to her, helping bring the others hope with the power and talent and skills that she's been given. Kanzeon, sometimes called Kanon, is extremely popular in Japan, like Risei, and her small Jizo statues can be found all over the place, mirroring not only the mass knowledge but mass marketing of Risei's merchandise, even as seen later in the game with the small models I mentioned. Many shrines are named after Kanon, and the fit is a really good one for Risei, not only in her character description but her character arc. The design of Kanzion in Persona 4 is similar to the last, with instead of the plain modest white gown, now a black and white gown, with slits exposing the sides of their legs. From the less modesty to the two opposite colors, I think this is meant to represent the proper integration of Risei and Reset as one figure, the model and the modest, the public and the private, and her ability to combine her personal private motivation and strength with her talent for being an idol. Her reach can go even farther in the world, with even more satellites now coming off of her figure. Risei's ultimate awakening is all that's left now. She's stewing on how the girl who looked to Risei for strength is now finding new friends and how things keep going forward. Risei now has to stew over the idea of relationships in general, the complicated nature of connecting with people, and how time, natural changes, and other people will always create a web of information that makes the relationships rarely stiff and rigid. She mentions how even if it's no one's fault and there is no malice, people continue hurting each other. Risei is talking about this girl, of course, but she's been thinking of the people who she feels she abandoned as well when she went to step away from her career. You will always be you, and you has many faces, but no matter what face or faces you display, you will always be hurting someone when helping another. One step forward toward a goal is one step farther away from another. Risei mentions this mutual respect that she now has for this girl who relied on her, this girl who has moved on. Finally, she evolves into Kolzeon, which is an alternate spelling for Kanzeon, representing the same figure as I mentioned before. From her design details, that's already in another segment, so I'll save my breath here. Risei Kujikawa is a member of the Lover's Arcana, and nearly every part of her design and personality points toward that with vigor. The Lover's card is about love. I, I mean, on the basic level, Risei is the most romantically suggestive and forward girl in the game toward the protagonist. The angel in the middle of the Lovers is the angel Raphael. It's an air sign and considered to be ruled by Gemini, which fits with Risei also being a Gemini, since she's born on June 1st. The Lovers also represents the harmony of the subconscious mind, with the man representing the subconscious, the logical, and the woman representing the feminine and the intuitive. Then Raphael represents the superconscious mind, the divine directive. Risei's case, I think we can see this as the unity of the many selves, brought together by the divine directive, which Risei finds to be helping others no matter what she's doing. Sometimes the card refers to the interior marriage of the conscious and the subconscious, also contributing to the many selves inside of Risei that is stretched fervently by her character, dungeon, social link, and overall arc. As one would imagine, on higher polarity, Lovers represents union, and on lower, it represents discord and disharmony. When we meet Risei, she is fighting with herself, unable to tell what is her and what isn't by rejecting the part she's embarrassed over or doesn't understand. Then, by the end of the dungeon and her link, she has come into harmony with her many selves, rejoining eventually as an idol, with the newfound inner strength and directive operating in harmony. 
Some additional aspects of her character I have yet to have talked about, and the largest thing I think would be considered a character flaw is her manipulative nature. Part of Risei's arc is her coming to term and pride with her ability to be who she wants, and the balance of the many selves inside of her sometimes leaning more in the sucking upside, but there are multiple times when she takes the flattery beyond mild self-gain, with no losing parties, and into, instead, manipulation. There's multiple times that she decides to fake cry or get overly angry about things she doesn't actually care about, but the primary example is during the Hot Springs trip, where Yukiko realizes that she should apologize after it's found out that the boys were actually doing nothing wrong or perverted, and had been robbed of their bath time due to poor time management essentially segregating them into their room by themselves to do nothing for the night and feel sad. Risei is the one who steps up and suggests Yukiko not make the situation right, and instead convinces all the girls it'll be their little secret. She doesn't need to apologize if they never admit to their mistake. Plus, this way they can have the bath the whole night with no downsides. This is pretty unapologetically scummy behavior, as many characters have at least one moment of throughout the game. But it does well to further her more well-rounded character. It also, due to its placement in the story, shows the other side of this imbalance that Risei is struggling with that we normally don't see. Her journey of coming to try and understand how to wield the different selves positively. She is also shown to express some moments of spitefulness coming from an insecurity of being undervalued. Since Kanji doesn't have any attraction or interest toward Risei, she seems to take it as a personal insult and says a lot of backhanded compliments to him throughout the game. Although, again, this is just one aspect of the pretty balanced character relationships from the investigation team in general. It's not like Risei and Kanji hate each other, even if they give each other a lot of sh Risei's first name could mean many things, but due to it being written in hiragana, most answers would have to be left up to speculation. Her last name, Kujikawa, however, is constructed of three kanji, with ku likely meaning a period of long time, ji referring to the sense of love or affection, and kawa being the classic kanji for river. In other words, the long-pouring current of affection. Risei makes herself the river for those seeking affirmation and a place in life. Her work spans a long ways across the country and affects many people for time and time memorial. That's the image I believe that we're supposed to draw from it. Also, the idea of this long-standing affection through a river of many ages also likely ties back to her persona, Kanzeon, or Kanon, who has the oldest temple in Japan, the Sensoji. This came around in the late 600s after supposedly two fishermen found a statue of Kanon in the river, taking it to the leader of the village and deciding in its sanctity to enshrine it. Risei Kujikawa's arc is about the never-ending search for the deep down, the true Risei, the trait of the soul, only for Risei to realize that it's only when each part of her lights the way that she can truly follow the path. It's a story about the balances of the many selves and many faces that we hold to the people in our lives, from personal to public, formal to casual. It's about us, and how while it is only natural for us to adjust and change in behavior and appearance, that there's always something tying us together. Ourselves. I hope you enjoyed this segment on Risei Kujikawa, and if you haven't, please check out my other parts. If you want to see me continuing to write videos like this, please donate to my Patreon so I don't sell all of my belongings and die hungry in the woods. I hope you found something interesting or uplifting in this video, and I hope to see you again soon.